rich investors look at wealth a little differently. Common theme amongst them all is that for most rich investors, they can stomach volatility much better than a retail investor. They ask me to say that, you know, when public markets are giving such attractive returns, do we really need to take that kind of illiquidity risk in order to invest into private markets? My argument to them, Neil, is that what the private markets is doing is actually investing into newer spaces, newer areas where you do not have access. What tends to happen for Indian clients mostly is that their worldview is US centric. Mm -hmm. So they only know about the Microsoft and the Tesla and the Alphabet mm -hmm. uh, and the Amazon. And they really don't look beyond in terms of great companies, which may be sitting in other parts of the world, which actually serve a global community. I'm speaking today with the person who heads India's largest investment advisor, Waterfield Advisors, uh, with 45,000 crores of assets. Uh, on average, um, Waterfield ha manages, uh, you know, an average investor financial portfolio of 154 crores. At the very bare minimum, you have to have 10 crores to become a client. Uh, and Soumya's own journey is fascinating uh, as an investor and, of course, heading Waterfield. Um, Soumya, delightful to chat with you. Thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, Soumya, my first question would be, how do the rich invest differently? So, what I've noticed in the last uh, 12 years in the journey at Waterfield is that rich investors look at wealth a little differently. And sometimes it also depends on whether that investor is a founder or whether the investor is next generation. Uh, or if the the uh, client is actually a woman. Each of these operates slightly differently because their outcomes in terms of the goals are slightly different. What we find with founders typically is that they are risk takers in their business, but they want to be a little bit more conservative when it comes to the preservation of their wealth. Whereas when you talk to a second generation, mm -hmm. they've already been accustomed to a certain level of wealth. So for them, it is about both preservation at one level, but you see them also um, looking at how they can build out new businesses. And therefore, there is a certain amount of risk that they may be willing, willing to take in terms of their family assets. So at the same time, when you look at a woman who is an investor, she's very goal oriented. And a rich woman in particular is a little bit more conscious about the fact that she needs to understand why she's investing into a certain product. So each one is slightly different. But the common theme amongst them all is that for most rich investors, they can stomach volatility much better than a retail investor. Because when they're investing, they have a very long term horizon for investment. And that really is a very big reason why liquidity needs uh, typically are not there as frequently. And that also then means that you may end up looking at different asset classes through a different lens because you're willing to take more equity risk, you're willing to take more private equity risk or private market risk, which you may not be as a retail investor because you're always much more conscious of liquidity. So this, I think, is a fundamentally big difference. The second is really around the rich themselves in terms of the client segment operate differently. When you're a founder, you typically have much more risk-taking uh, capacity and ability in your business, but you want to be a lot more careful in terms of managing the liquidity you've created. The next generation, on the other hand, has grown accustomed to wealth and therefore they may feel that they can afford to take a little bit more risk um, on the personal investing side than on the business side. So these are some subtle changes that we notice when we're talking to different kinds of investors. Okay. So to pick up on the first strand, which is private markets. Uh, and in your own portfolio, you have a substantial allocation of 30% to private markets. So just to put that in layman's language, that is essentially startups. It is unlisted companies, which the regular average Joe doesn't have access to. Um, so how risky are they and what kind of returns have they given? Um, so this is a very risky asset class because um, when you look at investing into this space, 
we see that you can invest either through the fund route or you can invest directly into companies and clients can choose both options and within that private market space you have both venture debt as well as venture capital and venture equity or private equity so these are all the different types which sit in private markets they are fundamentally more risky because um you're coming if you're doing venture investing or seed investing you're coming into a company where it may not even have revenue so you're taking a bet on the founder you're taking a bet on the team you're taking a bet on the investment thesis and the and the business model that's going to play out for that company and it is in some ways almost i would say it can be a bit like uh, spray and pray mm-hmm. at that stage of investing whereas as you start going into more mature companies that risk gets adjusted down because there's more predictability on the revenue there's predictability on profitability cash flows with that risk then it means that in private market investing you're always looking at like you would for any stock what is the price you get in and what is the price you exit um what happens in private markets is that the lead time that you may give for an investment is much longer and you may not also have the liquidity to come out when you please mm-hmm. whereas in public markets you can actually come out uh because you have a mark mark to market price you know what price you've got into you know at what price you're going to exit but in the case of private markets you don't have that liberty so somia what is the time horizon in private markets uh on average and also Let's talk about returns. What kind of returns do you get for all this risk? A uh, good question, and it varies uh, quite dramatically because you are ultimately, in the case of fund managers, you are taking a bet that the fund manager has a good process of due diligence to choose good underlying companies. So you could be in a situation, um, and the early days of uh, private equity in India was fraught with several real estate. funds if uh, you recollect me mm-hmm. and those didn't necessarily give very good returns as a result of which um and returns would be let's say in the region of maybe 9 10% which you could actually get in public markets debt mm-hmm. if you put money there so investors started asking the question that for that kind of illiquidity which could be 7 and 8 years did i res- necessarily need to put my money into private markets So the early experience that most investors had with private markets was actually quite poor. Mm-hmm. And it's only subsequently that you saw other funds which actually came out which actually started giving a kind of return. Um and that in the early stages again was where foreign investors came in and they would be the main LPs of the different funds that invested into India and they were seeing the returns. whereas the domestic investor never really had an opportunity mm-hmm. to actually invest in this asset class they've now come in in my sense over the last maybe 7 to 8 years mm-hmm. so it's only now that they're beginning to see um actual returns or what we call dpi mm-hmm. uh in terms of the distribution that they're getting from the investments that they've made mm-hmm. the kind of returns that we've seen has varied substantially there are those where we've seen um some very good funds which have returned upwards of 25 30% mm. in terms of uh, two to three times the initial fund that mm. they raised and there've been others that have not returned any money at all so for us we think a very crucial point in this asset class is choosing the right fund manager and a fund manager that has a track record that's very important when you invest in this asset class Right. So, in a good scenario, it's twenty-five to thirty percent CAGR. Yes. yes. Over a ten-year time period. Over a seven to ten-year period, because most of them will start exiting the investments at least a few by year seven, uh, and they also need to, and sometimes even exit sooner, because most of these funds are then raising their next fund. Mm. And what the investor, and I think to a certain extent, the domestic investor has become a little smarter. because they're saying unless you return money from your previous fund we really don't mm. want to invest in the next fund that's a shift which i've seen in the last maybe 2 years mm. because a lot of the early investors into these into the asset class are now quite conscious of the fact that return money first then ask for more fair enough but if you think of the markets over the past 3 or 5 years 
the public markets themselves are getting giving returns of this order uh in do you see a sort of shift then to public great question is probably the question i get asked the most um for investors because they're actually will they ask me to say that you know when public markets are giving such attractive returns do we really need to take that kind of illiquidity risk in order to invest into private markets my argument to them neil is that what the private markets is doing is actually investing into newer spaces newer areas where you do not have access in public markets this could be in the areas of certain innovation in healthcare it could be in areas like renewables in sustainability uh it could be in areas uh, such as robotics these are all spaces um which today you don't have a good public markets option and therefore um if you miss out on investing into private markets you may miss out on some of these larger trends that you see in terms of technological disruption uh which is impacting different businesses or it could be just in terms of just core good businesses that you're just not able to participate in because they don't want to come to public markets mm. so i feel the diversification is important so that you don't miss out on any areas of growth which are actually there in the economy so somia one area you mentioned is uh, private markets uh, startup private equity etc what is the other area or other other areas where the rich invest differently um i think the other area that the rich also invest slightly differently is when they start looking at global markets um they're looking to diversify their portfolios outside of just india risk um sometimes driven by a couple of uh, reasons one many of these families have business interests overseas already uh so they're quite widely exposed to markets and uh economies outside of india the second is that uh they may have their next generation who are actually studying overseas or looking to build futures careers outside of india and therefore for them how can we start looking at diversifying the portfolio outside of india becomes a key consideration and here we've seen that for a lot of indian families while they are well known in india um they're not as well known overseas with bankers and therefore they end up being relatively smaller clients in those banks or institutions and therefore don't get the same kind of service or support so we see that this is really a growing area for the rich where they want to be able to diversify their portfolios much more um through really the liberalized remittance scheme uh which they then actually uh take advantage of uh and i think in india you can do that through obviously the feed off funds which are there but given the sebi caps on the rupee denominated investments uh there is always a restriction in terms of how much they can invest uh but i would hope that if that changes then there can be greater domestic participation uh even through just feed off funds and rupee denominated investments into overseas markets right so again uh, you know with the point indian market for the past few years that has probably seemed like a bit of a losing bet in the past few years mm-hmm. except the us market of course um so do you see people doing more allocation domestically now because that obviously affects perception i i think it's more around diversification it's more a risk management tool i don't think it's necessarily a point of view that you know is there a better market outside i think the indian market so over the next 10 15 years is going to give us some staggering and stunning returns given just the fundamentals that are true for india but it's more just in terms of risk risk management that you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket and that's really what we try as investment advisors to suggest to clients so when you glo- diversify globally uh, you're not trying to pick the best market you're trying to exactly we were not trying to pick the best market because we also recognize that even geographies have cycles yeah. so there will be years in which the us will do well there'll be years when japan does very well like we're seeing right now there could be the next couple of years where the uk does very well there could be years in which southeast asia does well so when you have a global portfolio which is better diversified geographically 
chances are you can actually capture those market movements in these markets what tends to happen for indian clients mostly is that their world view is us centric mm -hmm. so they only know about the microsoft and the tesla and the alphabet mm -hmm. uh, and the amazon and they really don't look beyond in terms of great companies which may be sitting in other parts of the world which actually serve a global community so the intent is that how do you build a portfolio which is actually global in nature and not necessarily just one geography specific okay um now the lrs limit uh, that you mentioned might actually be quite low for a lot of your clients uh, 2.5 lakh dollars a year is you know a drop in the bucket um so will uh, a gift city change anything uh, and the recent rbi relaxations uh, on in companies investing abroad will that change anything um i think uh, it will definitely help the fact that you've got a gift city which then opens up a whole vista of instruments that uh, indian investors can actually invest into with certain incentives in the form of either capital gains or taxation or dividend i think is a welcome um is a is really welcome for indian investors to actually start exploring and in terms of what there is outside mm -hmm. i think that's a huge huge positive uh whether this will actually translate into flows i think is also a function of wealth managers in india being able to educate and also to help clients as they want to diversify their portfolios i think the challenge in the past has always been that even if you are a client of a bank in india how many of them really have enough know how or skills or knowledge on what's happening in overseas markets to invest that will change and i hope gift city will be perhaps that opening because it will mean that at least there are individuals who can stay within the geographic boundaries of india and still work in a jurisdiction which is deemed overseas and they can start understanding how offshore markets work so i see this is a huge positive uh, going forward will you launch a fund in gift city we have a license in gift city we have a license already for our fund of funds in order to attract foreign investment into india uh, because that's one of the things we want to do as um, as an organization we think that as investor interest is growing in india more so because of geopolitical reasons or otherwise india is quite in favor and a lot of global investors want to pare down their investment allocations to china they want to increase it to india but they're also not sure about how to navigate india because india is huge whether it's public markets or private markets or fixed income markets you need to be able to have a trusted partner that you can work with to help you navigate in terms of what are the best opportunities what are the best fund managers we see ourselves quite uniquely positioned there neil because our entire business model is without uh, uh you know having an alignment of interest with our clients so that means that we want to be able to showcase the best products fund managers in india to a global audience i feel that we could actually then actually help fund managers in india who are not making those trips to uh the us and europe and japan to raise capital we could actually say well we we know you and we think that you're a really good fund manager and really spotlight put the spotlight on some of these fund managers for investors that would never know these managers so that's the role of what we want to play uh, in terms of attracting capital into india so you have an fof that you already launched um uh, uh, we have a fof which we got a license for uh -huh. in gift city as well as here in india in india we have done our first close uh, we're looking to do a close shortly in gift city because that will be based on the anchors that we're able to get from global investors but all of which we really expect within the next 3 to 6 months right just to clarify for our viewers so an fof is a fund of funds that invest in other funds in this case uh, they would be private market funds or they are only private are market only. funds um, because that's where we saw the gap um, and part of the reason why we even launched a fund of funds in india neil was to really allow for domestic retail participation um, in some ways because the check size for investing into aif is just 1 crore 
Hmm. It's a commitment that you make. You can actually allocate over a five-year period because that's the drawdown schedule hmm. typically. That means about twenty lakhs a year. So we want to encourage over a period of time more participation from the domestic investor because what we also realize is that most of the best funds in India are raised from foreign investors, hmm. and when they raise from foreign investors, those foreign investors are then getting the benefits of the India story, and. I feel very personally and strongly about the fact that more domestic investors need to invest so that they can participate in the India story and get returns. But again, coming back and cautioning that the caution is around the fact that you need to choose good fund managers who have had and demonstrated track record of returning capital. Even the best will still make a few mistakes, mm. but you want to be able to have and work with those fund managers. That are likely to have a higher probability of success than failure. Hmm. Now let's talk about public markets. Uh, so in your own portfolio, you've been uh, tilted towards large cap and increasingly so over the past year. Um, but small and mid caps have rallied enormously. So what made you take that decision? So um, we were, as a house, and we were also beginning to see a little bit of froth develop. In the mid and small cap uh, space, in fact, I'd probably say micro cap specifically. Uh, so we were doing a study at Waterfield where we were looking at the return on equity for the last ten years um, of different companies, and what we saw is that while there was a certain earnings which were there, and I'll give you an example, we saw earnings for micro caps at fourteen percent, whereas the PE expansion was about seventy-eight percent. Uh, this was clearly telling us that something is going wrong here, uh, or not something going wrong. It's just the sentiment and the froth seem to be building up, mm -hmm. um, and that's when we said we need to start taking some money off the table here. Uh, of course, the way I've always believed, even in investing, is what I do for clients, I should do for myself, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that I do something else in my personal portfolio, and Waterfield is mm -hmm. suggesting something else. So. In October, November, in fact, the third quarter of the financial year, we started taking some profits off the table for small and mid caps and started orienting it towards the large caps. Mm -hmm. um, when I did the first Guru portfolio with you, mm -hmm. uh, I remember Neil that I was tilting towards large caps at that point. So I was, I was thinking on the lines of 55% moving to about 65% on large caps. At that time, I probably took it up to about 60. And kept about 40% in mid and small caps, and then in the last quarter of last uh, calendar year, uh, really started moving out of the small and mid cap towards large caps because we really saw that earnings were growing at about 24%, but uh, we were not necessarily um, seeing, um, or, or rather, the um, the P expansion was about 24%. The earnings was probably around 17, 18, and that. Risk reward made much more sense uh, than 14 versus 78, um, and that was really the change and the shift that we made. Um, of course. And now you are 70-75 percent. 70, and in fact, close to 75 percent in large caps. We're just about 25 uh, percent in mid and small. I will say that clearly there are opportunities which still exist in the mid and small cap space. I don't think one should say that you know it's across the board. But really, in pockets where we see that there is froth, um, I'd like to stay away from it. All right. Uh, on the debt side, I remember two years ago, um, it was a different tax regime, a different budget. Yeah. So you were doing quite a few uh, target maturity funds. Yeah. Uh, you shifted from that to REITs and invits. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I felt it. I think even I mentioned it in the earlier time when we spoke that I felt that I kind of missed out on the REITs and invits at that time. Took a conscious call to really start looking at that asset class much more closely. Um, we've liked it over the last one year. Um, so, post the debt taxation change, till then we really were suggesting to most clients to get into targeted mm. uh, majority plans because we said that you can create a ladder in terms of your bond portfolio. Because most of our clients, again, by virtue of being richer clients. They don't need the money, mm. so you're really locking into those returns right from now. Uh, but post the debt taxation change, 
um, I felt we needed to start looking much more closely at this asset class. We did. Uh, we've had some good wins through that because, again, distribution which happens regularly. Um, and we've also seen that for most of the three REITs specifically that are there, they're all trading at about 10 to 20 percent discount of their net asset value which is published. So it is actually even now an opportunity which is there. Um, but again, um, you've got to be comfortable with that kind of risk and you've also got to, you know, there are the vagaries and there are two schools of thought mm. are commercial real estate given, you know, post COVID people working from home, is there going to be lower occupancy, which is there? I think we're coming out of that. And we think that over the next couple of years, given India's growth and how we're positioned as an economy, we're going to see that occupancy inch up. And therefore, there is really a play for this within the portfolio. Everything in moderation. Sure. I think that's the way I look at it. There's no silver bullet. Absolutely. What kind of yields are you getting there? So we're actually seeing um, close to about eight and a half, nine. Um, and given that uh, where debt mutual funds are, we think it's a pretty good story to actually come up. Fair enough. Um, do you do any gold? Uh, we do. Um, at the time of the earlier portfolio, I remember I was about 5% in gold. Continue very much in gold, but a little lower, not at 5 maybe about 2% 2, 2 in gold. But I'm taking all those exposures largely passive. Uh, gold ETFs, not or sovereign gold bonds. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two instruments that I have. Okay. Uh, real estate is just your house? Yes, it's just a primary residence. Um, and perhaps now because I'm taking the exposure through REITs mm -hmm. to a certain extent, I won't say I'm totally out of real estate. But uh, I felt that uh, perhaps the financial markets is one where there is a little bit more liquidity which is available when you need it. So I tend to uh, want to capture that opportunity a bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, for real estate, it's just the primary risk. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from uh, REITs and invits, a lot of people do arbitrage funds as a tax efficient way of debt. Do you believe in that? We do. Uh, we do believe in that given that it has the equity taxation, certainly for clients who are looking at parking money temporarily, or at least little over a year, we do have, uh, we do suggest arbitrage funds. Um, but it's not something that we really want them to stay in arbitrage funds for three and four mm. years. I think if that was the case, then I'd rather do a passive investment mm. into equities. Uh, and we really help clients with their cash flow requirements. And that's where I think the role of the financial planner comes in um, quite mm. a bit, Neil, because you want to sit with your client to really understand um, what is it in terms of their expenses, their liquidity requirements and so forth. And that I think is the beauty of the RIA mm -hmm. uh, at one level because it's not about distribution, it's not about a product. It's really about sitting with the client and understanding what are the goals, what are the outcomes and planning and investing on that basis, which is I think much more rewarding both for the planner as well as for the client. Absolutely. Um, and you've been a big believer. <laughs> I in, have, I have in indeed. That so how much do you charge then? Um, so we charge a percentage of the assets, uh, depending upon what is the assets that we actually manage. This was post um, the regulatory change that said that you could actually charge a percentage of the assets. That's worked much more in favor for us. Um, and that varies anywhere between about, it could be about 20 basis points all the way till about 50 basis points on advising. Oh, that's very reasonable. It's quite reasonable. Yeah, we want to be reasonable. We want to be reasonably priced. Um, because at the end of the day, I think the ambition for Waterfield also, Neil, is to be able to work with a much larger set of clients over a period of time. We started as a company which was at the top end of the pyramid. And then we kind of worked our way down in some sense. So earlier it was the ultra high net worth global client. We then started working with clients that had 10 to 30 million in financial assets. Those were largely family businesses, first time entrepreneurs. Then we said, okay, can we be relevant to professionals? Can we be relevant to women? And these are the segments that we now want to really start working with because we think we have a lot to offer. And 
unfortunately i don't think there are enough choices for uh, for clients because they're only exposed to their banks or maybe a wealth management outfit that is either local or maybe just burgeoning or someone who's just a pure tech platform my own belief is that wealth management is quite complex it's not just about investments it's also about a lot of non investment related services that clients need because um you have life events that happen to you you have you could have a child with special needs you may have lost your job um you may be going through a divorce these are all situations that happen as a result of which wealth management services are required so we feel that we need to be an organization that can help address those life events can you tell us one decision that you think is the probably the best decision you made in terms of building your own wealth and one mistake that um, you think hindered that process the most the one best decision i think in my own wealth creation is probably starting waterfield because uh, what i think i realized is that as a business person you're probably going to create a lot more wealth for yourself then you will as a being an employee being an employee so i think in terms of wealth creation clearly if it works well uh and obviously caveat it for if it works well i think wealth creation as a business owner significantly higher than as an employee um the one decision that's probably hindered the wealth creation um I can't think of one really. I can't I can't think of one that's uh, that's really hurt the portfolio or hurt my portfolio or hurt my wealth. Maybe the only thing is again maybe being an entrepreneur for years on end you don't take um uh, you know you don't take a salary, right? Which means that you're giving up to a certain extent on your earning capacity. If I'd earn the money as a sal- as a salaried individual or otherwise for those number of years i would probably have then had more in terms of liquid wealth um which i kind of traded off for mm. ownership um yeah i think situation. you had bought insurance policies at some point right i yeah. did uh oh, oh that was that was that was very early on because as a, again a salaried individual uh the first thing i was i think they just the uh, the Uh, LIC agents just make kind of be high you know you're like a honey bee so you <laughs> everyone kind of ends up finding somebody who doesn't have insurance that yeah i think that meal was not a great outcome because what happened is i ended up paying the um premiums in the early days and then after that the agent moved i moved we forgot about the policy and then i just realized that the kind of money that i was spending for the kind of cover um was just too too small and didn't make sense at all i think that also really comes to then the point of even in wealth creation such an important part of the advice that people have to give is that how do you protect the purchasing power of your wealth and whether it's inflation or otherwise we need to be very conscious of that too many individuals i feel get quite consumed by the absolute returns mm-hmm. and the absolute amount that they make mm-hmm. but they always need to peg it back to inflation and say is my money really growing for me insurance for me was a bit like that mm. uh, it wasn't keeping up with it inflation. wasn't keeping up with inflation it wasn't keeping up with my needs or where i'm going to retire when when you're 20 and you're taking out insurance everybody tells you about 60 and you're looking 40 years out but you don't realize that your financial needs at 60 or even by the time you hit 50 can actually be quite different than what the policy is actually giving you. Hmm. So and you don't do any insurance anymore. No like only health, only health. Um and that's really a bit of a difference from last time I think. Did the medical cover that the company had which was uh, which was what was there last time and this time but I've added to the health cover. I've added about a crore in terms of health um which again I think as you grow older you also have a sense of your own mortality. and you realize that you know health is wealth in many many ways um so added about a crore of cover on that front 
All right, Soumya. Thank you so much. It was lovely speaking to you. Thank you, Neil. It was such a pleasure, and thank you for your time. Thank you.